started. Welcome to the Saving Life on Earth webinar. I'm Tiara Curry. I'm a senior scientist here at the Center for Biological Diversity, and I'm so excited to explore our new partnership with the Book of Extinction. So some of you from the Center community might be wondering why the Center for Biological Diversity is doing a D&D webinar, and some of you from the gaming community might be wondering what is the Center for Biological Diversity, and also how can I help stop extinction? So we're going to do our best to explore both of those things tonight, and we're looking forward to a lively Q&A at the end. We're going to save a lot of time for that. Science has made clear that we're in the midst of an extinction crisis. More than a million species are at risk of becoming extinct. So we have all of the science we need. We know things are bad, but science isn't going to get us out of this mess that we've created. We have to win people's hearts and minds. We have to address this with passion and creativity, and we have to do it across social sectors and across disciplines. So that's what this project is about. And while we work hard every day to prevent any more plants and animals from going extinct, it's important to take the time to remember the ones that we have lost and to learn from those mistakes so that we don't repeat them. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lucas to introduce himself and to introduce the Book of Extinction. Thanks, Sierra. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Lucas Zellers. I'm a narrative designer. Um, podcast producer, digital marketer, a whole lot of things that a communications degree gets you. But for the last two years, I've found my home as the project lead for Book of Extinction. It is a bestiary of extinct animals resurrected for fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and our publisher there is Mage Hand Press. So that is a small team of multinational artists, writers, editors, uh, and Dungeons and Dragons enthusiasts who create the best third-party content available for the game. Um, and before we get into it, I do I do want to ask if you could just uh, if you can just drop in the chat how many of you are familiar with Dungeons and Dragons at all? And actually, let's do it this way: if you are, um, if you could rate your familiarity on a scale from one to twenty, uh, <laughs> drop that number in the chat. Yeah, there's the natural 20 and the natural one, right? The first. <laughs> yeah, I saw that zero and I appreciated it because before <laughs> I met Lucas, that was me. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing a good spread here. So I'll, uh, <laughs> oh, mom of a dragon master uh, or dungeon master rather. Well, then you are my people. Thank you for making an opportunity for somebody to, uh, to have, to have that, that, that hobby, that activity in your home. Did you see um, there were 30s and zeros on your scale of 1 to 20? And that's so <laughs> typical of the D&D community. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, we like rules to a point, and then we like breaking them. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll explain briefly, uh, for those of you who are closer to the bottom of the scale, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is the most well-known tabletop role-playing game. And it's a it's a pen and paper game that I like to think of as an exercise in collective storytelling, where the consequences of players' choices are adjudicated by rolls of dice. And not just the six-sided dice that you might be familiar with. These dice have up to 20 sides. Um, and I do remember one of the, uh, oh, a crit Critical Role fan. Yeah, um, with shows like Stranger Things and, uh, and Critical Role, um, this game has come out of the relative obscurity that it enjoyed in the 70s and 80s and into uh, a new generation of players who have mostly started with its fifth edition that trimmed out a lot of the, the math and the, and the overhead and a lot of the, the careless representation that the game was known for in its early years and has become something really accessible uh, that, that draws people together and gives them a new way of telling stories together and, and talking to each other and understanding the world. So for me, it was a really unique opportunity to see that there was this, uh, there was this new language that we were creating of how to tell each other stories and how to rate consequences and look at the world and reduce it to things um, that we could conceptualize rather than um, just sort of a... Uh, uh, an, an opaque mass of rules and animals that we sort of knew were out there um, uh, and down to something that that uh, we could handle on a Saturday night uh, and really wrap our heads around um, in, a, in a way that's very personal and collaborative. So 
Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is is a fantasy game. It's firmly in in the in the fantasy genre, having its roots in places like uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's work, The Lord of the Rings, um, and some of the uh, some of the best of the Weird Tales magazine. So, uh, it, so both mechanics wise and genre wise, it was a great pick for this work because in both cases, um, this is a this is. Uh, very connected to the idea of extinct species. The fantasy genre almost r runs, is fueled by nostalgia, I think. Um, it's it's concerned with the past and the and its echoes into the future. So when we were looking at the concept of uh, when we were looking at the concept of how to do this, we I knew that that uh, fantasy was going to be a really great home for this. Um, so I, I got the idea about two years ago. I wanted I'd been designing for Dungeons and Dragons for a few years. Uh, and I wanted to to work on a larger scale project. And I knew I was very much a fan of the Monster Manual. It's one of the core source books in the game. And uh, that it's just a list of monsters and where they come from and what they do. And that was very, in, very appealing to me as a kid. I remember paging through that that book. I didn't have any idea what was going on with the numbers, but uh, there were pictures of unreal beasts and imaginative worlds, and it really grabbed hold of me in exactly the same way that uh, illustrated field guides and uh, animal encyclopedias did. So um, I really wanted to go back to that, that thing that had inspired me in the first place. And very quickly in the research for this, I discovered some of the things that Tierra had known all along, that we were in the midst of an extinction crisis. Um, and that there was a real sense of urgency to this topic that I hadn't known about before. Uh, and that's the same journey that I want people to go on with Book of Extinction to start from where I was with like, hey, here's a book of cool pictures and fun things that you can put in your game to uh, a real knowledge and understanding of our place in the world and our place in history and why this is such a pivotal moment. Um, and the partnership with the Center for Biological Diversity was a real gift because from there I could say, here's what to do about it, uh, which is something that I couldn't could never have offered on my own. So I'm really grateful uh, that we are at this point in the project. Yeah, so I'll tell you how Lucas and I met. He was doing so much research for this. He found a press release that I put out in 2011 about an obscure species that we'll get to in a minute. And I was so excited because <laughs> it's so hard to get people excited about things that I'm excited about, like freshwater <laughs> mussels and snails and fairy shrimp. And so here was somebody reaching out 11 years after a press release and asking me all the details about this animal. And then I was just like, this is the most exciting project ever. <laughs> How can I help? <laughs> because it's so important not to let plants and animals just slip into obscurity. Like we, it's just so important to keep them alive in the imagination and to use that as inspiration to take action now. So this just felt like a perfect, a perfect fit. And so Lucas also does a podcast and I was a guest on there and Kieran Suckling, our executive director was also a guest on there. And we'll, we'll put those links in the chat for you if you wanna go check out his podcast. So Lucas, <laughs> you're doing this manual. There's no shortage of species to choose from because you're not just looking at contemporary species. You went, you went all the way back in recorded history to choose these organisms. So how did you, how did you choose the species? Yeah, it's a great question. There are a lot of books about extinct animals out, of, out there, and a lot of them do a really great job of giving a, a representative sample of what we've lost over the last uh, 500 years or so. And our job was slightly different. We needed animals that had uh, a certain function or a way to, to kind of retell them in a certain way. Um, but what it came down to for me was that I wanted to limit it to animals that had faced human-caused extinction or anthropogenic extinction, um, which led me all the way back to the Pleistocene. There's an argument that megafauna like the uh, the giant ground sloth and the giant beaver and the glyptodonts, um, we don't know why they went extinct, but we have a pretty good guess that it was due to overhunting. Um, uh, that's one theory anyway. Uh, but the, the the thing that really moved my heart was that over the last 500 years, the number of anthropogenic extinction has gotten uh, anthrop anthropogenic extinctions has gotten out of hand. 
Um, so that was the main criteria that we used. And then we uh, then we took a slice um, and tried to try to figure out what we could do with them. How we we were limited on uh, we limited ourselves to animals whose stories we could tell well in this medium. And there's some. Uh, design challenges and uh, uh, guidelines that the game gave us that we had to meet. Um, and that gave us a list of, at this point, a little over 70 animals uh, that we were able to add to the project. So he started researching these and was writing about their real life story, how they went extinct, what was known about them. And he would send them to me to review for scientific accuracy, which led me down a whole lot of wormholes. And I learned a lot through this project. Um, but then I don't know anything about d and And so the second part of these accounts are like magical powers and how you take these animals that I knew about and turn them into characters. So can you like walk us through some of these? Yeah, uh, we've got a handful that we want to show off tonight. Uh, and let's start with the Florida fairy shrimp. Um, this was this was a pretty this was a pretty interesting story to me. It reminded me of that uh, uh, oh, I'm going to tell my age because the Counting Crows song was a cover, you know, um, uh, parking lot. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Um, Joni that was this, yeah, Joni Mitchell. <laughs> That's that my the, age. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Big yellow taxi. Thank you. Let us know if you were familiar with the Joni Mitchell or the Counting Crows <laughs> version in the chat and we'll see if we can get an informal poll going. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was the one that we started with. Um, so, uh, let's, let's go for, I've got a handful of these. Let's go through the, the stories that we had, and then I'll tell you what we did with them. Uh, and then we'll get into what we can learn from it. So the Florida fairy shrimp is actually the species that Lucas called me up to chat about because he found this old press release because we petitioned for protection for it under the Endangered Species Act back in 2010. And in 2011, the Fish and Wildlife Service said that it was extinct and they couldn't protect it. So it lived in a single pond outside Gainesville in Florida. It was described in the 1950s. It was actually collected in the 1930s, not described as a species until the 1950s. And then it was re-described in, in 2002. In 2002, it was re-described. So then there are scientists who think it could still be out there, which would be very exciting, but the service declined to protect it and just said it doesn't exist anymore. So when Lucas found me to like give it a second life, I was very excited. Yeah, for me, it was a, a gut punch story of too little and too late. Um, but let me punch up, uh, let me punch up my PowerPoint here and I'll show you what we came up with. So there are no pictures of a living Florida fairy shrimp in existence. Yeah, and uh, part of the reason that I got in touch with you, Tiara, was that I couldn't find anything. Like the body of li literature that had been created around this thing um, can cover a couple of paragraphs. It's the whole story. Um, this is the 2002 description that I found uh, of it. Um, and it's the same one that I gave to our, our artist when we were putting it together. Um, we we made a commitment to accuracy in making this book. And a huge part of that was Tierra's work in like checking some facts for me, uh, like how many species of freshwater dolphin are there actually? Um, it's a matter of some conjecture. Uh, but another part of that was making sure that when I gave this uh, these species to our artist, that he had really solid reference to work with, that we were referring to the exact species um, and the exact shape, we got the coloration as right as we could, the anatomy details as right as we could. Uh, and then we just kind of let him do his thing. Um, uh, we had the benefit of, uh, of turning this loose in a fantasy world where the rules are more extreme and more fun and more as though through a funhouse mirror. Um, and this is what he came back with. It's one of the it's one of the sillier things I have asked an artist to do. I said, yeah, this creature has at least six limbs, but please pose it as though it is in modern dance. Uh, and I'll tell you where the mythology came together for me is when I realized this creature is about a, uh, an inch and a half long. And if you don't know, Dungeons and Dragons is played at a one uh, is played on a one inch scale. So any uh, any player character would be about, sorry about a, an inch and a half tall 
when they're in the game when you're looking at them. Uh, so immediately I was like, actually, it happened at 11 o'clock at night. I jumped out of bed. I said, it's a D and D mini. That's what it is. Um, so I ran downstairs and I was able to write this whole, uh, it came together immediately. I was able to write this whole history of how these creatures are um, oracles and diplomats and they model, they do scale models of war by request. Um, and that, that really got at one of the things we wanted to, uh, one of the things we wanted to tell with this book was how much we can learn from these creatures and the, the missed opportunities that we had with the ones who were, who have gone extinct. So the podcast that I did with Lucas, he didn't let me see this art ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> so he like revealed it to me during the podcast to get my initial initial take. And I was so excited. I just thought that it was it was so cool and so powerful and long live the fairy shrimp in the imagination. Yeah, I'm I'm hugely, I'm hugely excited that there is something else in the world for people to look at uh, other than this. Like we can do way better. <laughs> and so there's so little known about the species that the account that Lucas put together for the Book of Extinction is comprehensive. And he's actually one of the world experts and has <laughs> probably spent more hours speaking about the fairy shrimp. There are, um, when we were doing publications about it being lost, we had to just use images of other fairy shrimp because there were for this one there's just the drawing so we the things on the internet that are labeled florida fairy shrimp are other species of fairy shrimp yeah that was a challenge in the book um and we're gonna i think we're gonna come to that with the south florida rainbow snake um i i pictured the uh i pictured this creature and we just were able because fairies are already present in dungeons and dragons we just got to flip it around and call this one the shrimp fairy and I, I definitely pictured them as something we can uh, something we can learn from, like mechanically in the game. This is a, a creature that could move you forward along your adventure and forward in your story. Um, is there is there a parallel to that in the real world, Tierra? Absolutely. I mean, I I mean the species the species was lost because of development, and development is still one of the leading causes of wildlife loss and extinction. And especially in Florida, our Florida team is busy fighting it every day. And so we promised you action things that you could do. We are trying to get Endangered Species Act protection for all populations of the eastern gopher tortoise. And the biggest threat to the eastern gopher tortoise is ongoing development in Florida and the southeast. And so we have an action alert where you can write to Fish and Wildlife Service and ask them to protect it so that it isn't lost. Bobby, who's behind the scenes, just posted that into the chat for you if you want to copy it. And, or you can go to our website, biologicaldiversity.org, and look at our action alerts. And there's lots of actions you can take there. All right, so the next species that, that we're going to introduce you to has pretty much the same story. Um, <laughs> do you want to put up the, the picture, or should I talk about? Yeah, let me pull this up. Uh, we're not moving too far from the from the home of the Florida fairy shrimp here. Um, this is the South Florida rainbow snake. So the story here is largely similar. We petitioned for this species to be protected under the Endangered Species Act in the same petition in 2010. And in 2011, the Fish and Wildlife Service came back and said it's extinct. And it also, there's been some unverified sightings and lots of people out looking for it. So this is another one that we haven't given up total hope that it could exist, but there's been lots of people out looking for it. So it's probably gone, but hopefully not. It was discovered in 1952. It lived in Fish Eating Creek by Lake Okeechobee, and its habitat was largely polluted and lost to development, which is an ongoing battle and a similar story to the, to the fairy shrimp. So Lucas, tell us how you gave this one a, a second life. <laughs> uh, well, this so uh, I have I have family in Florida. I've gotten the opportunity to visit, uh, and Florida's natural ecosystems are incredibly evocative. Um, these are some of the meanest, deepest swamps that the United States has to offer. And uh, for me, you know, I, I everything that we did was just like 
um, make it bigger, make it crazier, make it wilder. Uh, almost everything we did, in some cases less, but uh, that was a big watchword for us. So um, I really focused on that idea and pictured this as uh, a swamp dwelling dragon rather than a snake. Um, those two, uh, the snake and the dragon are very closely related in folklore. And um, <clears throat> I figured that light would be um, really important in in a in a swamp ecosystem, especially if you're trying to adventure through it. In Dungeons and Dragons, how well the space is lit has direct mechanical impact on how well you can progress. Um, what can see you before you see it? Uh, so when I gave all of that to my artists, I was like, okay, I want you to make a light bending swamp dragon. And about a week or so later, this is what he came back with. It's perfect. Uh, this is, shout out to our artist, Lucas Ferreira CM. You can find him on Twitter at, at Carnero RPG. Um, and uh, he gave us a happy little cultist for scale. One of the things we did have to change in this image was that uh, his first instinct was to give this, uh, give this snake two very long, very threatening fangs right in the front of its mouth, which is for uh, for composition wise uh, and as a way of like drawing the eye and really telling the player that this is a dangerous creature was a smart move. But I had to come back and say this uh, this is a constrictor, and uh, that means it has teeth that looks like this. Um, so we were really able to have this great back and forth with uh, with our artists and work very closely together to make sure the scale pattern is right. Um, the teeth are right, and the only thing that we've changed is the fact that it's a gigantic uh, light-bending swamp creature of darkness. <laughs> Someone just asked about stats, and they're in there because I saw them and didn't know what they meant. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, we're going to get into this a little bit in the passenger pigeon. I didn't want to overwhelm detail people with details uh, too quickly. But if you've played the game, you might recognize this is a huge dragon, chaotic evil, we called it the Nightfire Worm. Uh, it's a challenge rating 11, so pretty serious in terms of uh, its ability to, to interact with players. And um, the, the cheeky bit here is that if, it, uh, if any kind of fire, lightning, or radiant damage is dealt to it, it can immediately deal it back to the players. Um, so this is a thing that not only gathers light from the environment that it lives in, but it's able to manipulate it directly from people who are, uh, from people who are attacking it. One of our scientists at the center actually went to Florida on an expedition to help look for this snake. And a couple of years ago, another rainbow snake subspecies was seen in Florida for the first time in a long time. And we all got really excited, but it's too far from where this one was found to be the South Florida rainbow snake, unfortunately. Um, and pollution is one of the things that contributed to the demise of the South Florida rainbow snake. And it's an ongoing issue, especially like with Florida manatees who their habitat is polluted by outflow from Lake Okeechobee, which kills the seagrass in conjunction with climate change. And so they're feeding them lettuce. There's so many things we can do to take better care of our waterways. This was a, an aquatic snake and yesterday was World Water Day. And so many endangered species depend on clean water, like the hellbender salamander, which I hope it never goes extinct, but it would also make a great D&D &D character, like a so living character. The hellbender? Yeah. Uh, this is one of the few instances in which I'm very happy to be disappointed. I had plans <laughs> for the hellbender and I crossed it off the list uh, with some satisfaction. Yeah, hellbenders are amazing and I hope that they've been here longer than us and I hope they outlive us. Um, we're going to put another action alert you can take in the chat about atrazine, which is banned in a lot of countries, but not here. And atrazine disrupts the endocrine system of freshwater animals. And so it needs to go and you can use your voice to help get rid of it. And you can find that there's the action alert or you can find it on our website too under biologicaldiversity.org backslash action. All right. The next one is probably the most famous extinct species. Yeah, it's certainly one of them. And it was one of the first ones that we put together for the book. Uh, this is the passenger pigeon, Ectopistes migratorius. Um, I've told this story so often in the past uh, two years because it's one of the ones that... Um, uh, yeah. uh, I don't know if this is Martha. I think this is uh, this is a male specimen. Um, let me see if I have it in my notes. 
Uh, yeah, this is from the teaching and research collections at the Laval University Library. Um, yeah, she's uh, they're definitely a poster child for extinction. Um, there hasn't really been a bird as numerous as the passenger pigeon. It uh, was less a, less a creature and more a biological phenomenon, a living storm that moved over uh, the United States before European settlement. Um, it took advantage of massed fruiting of beech and oak trees. These were very fast flyers and there were very, very many of them. So at any given time, one of uh, the US's uh, old growth forests was probably in massed fruiting and the passenger pigeons could get there in numbers and take advantage of uh, and take advantage of that readily available protein. Um, and when European settlers began to hunt the bird on an industrial scale um, and westward expansion being carried largely on the back of wild game so abundant and easily caught, um, passenger pigeon populations were uh, were strained to the breaking point. And it happened almost before anybody knew that it was happening because how could you measure a bird as numerous as this? Uh, I, I don't really blame people at the time for being unable to conceive of a world in which there wouldn't be one of these. Flocks of them darkened the sky from horizon to horizon for hours or days at a time. Their nesting grounds covered acres of land at once. Uh, and yet, in the by the early 1800s, the last, or rather, the early 1880s, the last wild flocks had disappeared. And then, in the summer of, uh, I believe, 1910, the last passenger pigeon in the world uh, passed away at the Cincinnati Zoo, and her name was Martha. Interestingly, Martha's um, Martha's body was uh, frozen in ice and passed on to the Smithsonian Museum uh, for. Uh, preservation, and she's still there, um, from what I understand. The same procedure was followed with uh, Incus, the last pa Carolina parakeet, who also died at the Cincinnati Zoo. Only Incus, is, uh, Incus never arrived, and no one really knows what happened to him. Um, he's out there in the winds, and the Carolina parakeet is in the book, and we do have a suggestion for what happened to Incus. The passenger pigeon story is connected to so many other stories as well. It's thought that the American burying beetle, which is now an endangered species, might have specialized on passenger pigeon carcasses. So when the passenger pigeon was lost, the American burying beetle population also tanked. And there's also researchers who think that these guys ate American chestnuts and that the loss of American chestnuts was another blow to them. I always think about, so I work on monarch butterflies, and when I first started looking into them, because someone told me that they were really threatened, I said out loud to my friend in Minneapolis, monarchs aren't endangered. There's no way. There's too many of them. They're everywhere. And now I'm like, oh my God, monarchs are under their quasi-extinction threshold because they're so vulnerable to climate change and pesticides and but it's that complacency about common species that we've seen so much that American bumblebees are another one, just species that we grew up with and saw everywhere that are now in steep decline as our 40% of US species are in an extinction risk category now, which is a number that it's hard to wrap your head around. And the same thing was probably true with the passenger pigeons. I, I read a, a thing from the state of Ohio that said, there's no way they could be threatened. They're everywhere. There's there's too many of them. We don't need to manage for them. So it's I think the cautionary tale here is that we do need to manage for everything because there's so many threats now. We can't take for granted that any species is okay. Yeah, the time to protect a species is while it is still abundant. Um, and in this case, uh, I think there wasn't really uh, there wasn't. It's hard to it's hard to imagine a, a species more abundant than the passenger pigeon. Um, and the fact that they moved in swarms is uh, is reflected directly by a mechanic in the game. Um, so D Dungeons and Dragons already has a language for this kind of a creature with sort of a collective mind. In the conception of the game, of course, it's fueled by magic rather than whatever logic birds have amongst themselves and have refused to share with us as of yet. Um, but in this one, we were able to conceptualize it not just as one bird, but as a swarm of birds called the feathered tide. I think we're borrowing from some of the, uh, um, 
I think I think that's a book title actually. One of the one of the books about uh, the passenger pigeons is called The Feathered Tides, where I got the idea. Um, so I want to show you what this looks like in the book, and then we'll run through a couple of the statistics on it very quickly for the for the statistics and crunch nerds in the in the crowd. Um, it was important to me so that the book show each animal alongside its magical version, so you you knew what uh, what kind of excuse me what kind of real world antecedent you were working with. Uh, so we have a stat block for a passenger pigeon. It's rather unremarkable. Uh, by the way, if, uh, for a point of reference, the most powerful straight beast in the game is, of course, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, because, of course, we have those. Uh, and it has a challenge rating of eight. Uh, so beasts, like just straight beasts, fall off very quickly uh, in terms of their relevance to the game as players progress from levels one to 20. So we suggested. Um, the passenger pigeon might be something you encounter at the very beginning of your adventure, a challenge rating zero. And we suggested a swarm that would be encountered uh, at challenge rating five. So let me zoom in on this a little bit. Uh, a gargantuan swarm of tiny beasts, you treat it as though it covers at least uh, five squares. So um, about five of these uh, as we go through. Um, and uh, I'll pause on alignment real quick. Somebody suggested that the uh, the uh, the night fire worm wouldn't be chaotic evil, just misunderstood. Uh, it was very difficult for me to tack the word evil onto games, um, and we're using kind of an older convention. Dungeons and Dragons is moving away from these prescriptive sort of uh, ethical and moral alignments as we go, uh, and more towards something that uh, kind of typical language. Um, the uh, and in case you need to know, there, every creature has six basic statistics, six uh, six scores on which it's judged for everything in the world. Um, and that is strength, dexterity, and constitution to reflect its physical attributes, and intelligence, wisdom, and charisma to affect its uh, mental attributes. In this case, the, the wisdom is kind of the highest one. It's the one that's usually used to um, reflect uh, the, the creature's understanding of the world. Um, real quick, uh, that's the challenge rating, um, and challenge rating does tend to run from 1 to 30, so you can get a sense of where this fits in the relative um, dangerousness of the world. The major ability here that makes this what it is is create passenger. Uh, so if you en any beast that enters the swarm might also might be magically subsumed by it and added to its biomass. Uh, and that that was fueled to me by um, zombie stories and the, how the monster always returns and the loss of identity as a threat in in uh, zombie media. Um, the idea that this swarm would overtake you and, and remove what makes you what you were. Uh, and then, of course, we have one of the <laughs> one of the the traits that it inherited from its uh, historical cousin is migratory recall, um, that the swarm can perfectly recall any path it has traveled, which already existed in the game. I was just able to grab that. Uh, other creatures are known to have that and add it to the passenger pigeon. Um, it's part of how these uh, the stories that we tell are already related to the natural world, hand and glove. Um, I did. I will add because we got the question in the chat. Um, the book is live on Kickstarter at the moment. We're busily smashing through stretch goals, and the um, the more we raise for, to make this book happen, the more monsters I'm going to put in it. Uh, so you can find out all that you need to know at deadmonstermanual.com. Yeah, I was I was really happy to support the Kickstarter because I really want to hold the book in my hands and like look at the the real story and the and the picture and. It's just so cool. So let's do one or two more more stories before we open up the Q and A. Yeah, let me jump forward. Um, this is almost certainly familiar to everyone here. Uh, this is the thylacine, Thylacinus cynocephalus, uh, and uh, before settlers arrived from Britain in the late seventeen hundreds, uh, an entire island ecosystem had developed in the dense forests of the island of Tasmania where marsupials filled pretty much every ecological niche that elsewhere in the world was occupied by mammals. And I have to imagine for the first uh, for the first party who arrived that it must have seemed like every sort of just a little bit sideways fairy tale that had ever been told in the collective consciousness, the the mirror world, the uh, the world as if through a looking glass. Um, and, uh, you know, Every they say that every small island endemic should be considered automatically endangered, and one of the the creatures that taught us that was 
uh, was the thylacine. Um, reports, uh, so herding dogs and their wild descendants com competed for the same food sources and habitats used by thylacines. Um, introduced predators and non-native species made it difficult for them to live. Uh, and worse, the thylacine became, uh, became the target of uh, speculation uh, for killing domestic sheep, even though it wasn't proved whether or not they could do that, to, to certainly not to my satisfaction. Um, the thylacine became so universally and violently hated that between 1835 and 1910, a concerted effort was made to exterminate the species from the island entirely, and most experts agree it worked. Um, after that, though, the thylacine has enjoyed a second life as kind of Tasmania's Bigfoot. Uh, it's it's uh, it's well beloved by our friends under the equator. Um, the last known thylacine in the world, as far as we understand, was named Benjamin, uh, and he passed away on September 7th, 1936, at the Bomaris Zoo in Tasmania. The, the story of the thylacine's extinction reminds me of so many stories of over-exploitation and vilification of wild animals. It's what we still do with wolves. Um, there's it's hard to pick a particular parallel to focus on I think of also like horseshoe crabs that we exploit for use in medical treatment and we're basically stealing all the food of migratory red knot shorebirds like we're leaving them 10 percent of what they need as we grab the horseshoe crab so it's like an, an indirect exploitation story but also I mean we still just kill animals the we have so much work that we're doing to ban trophy hunting imports into the United States. And right now we're working on leopards. So we're gonna put a link that you can take to, to help save leopards from being killed and imported as trophies, because it seems like we haven't really learned our lesson about, about needless exploitation of animals. Yeah, certainly one of the things that uh, certainly one of the things that Book of Extinction offers is another way of getting involved in stories like this. Uh, I believe that being able to retell these stories and give people a personal connection to them is um, is one of the other things that you guys can do, is that you guys, that we can do um, to uh, to to stop this this thread and kind of reverse the the sliding scale on this. Um, in this in the case of the thylacine, the, the monster we came up with was inspired by the real life legacy of the creature more than it was the, the creature's intrinsic attributes. Um, so we wanted a creature that could both charm and frighten creatures, uh, players in the game. Uh, for this one, um, what we got, uh, again, we're relying on one of the names that this creature had in life, the ghost tiger, for its ability to hide extremely well in forest environments. Um, in ours, though, is literally incorporeal. Uh, and I have to say, uh, understanding that a beast is called a ghost tiger and uh, is very difficult to spot is one thing, but then being handed an image of an actual ghost is a, to is a whole other thing. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the book. Um, our ghost tiger is also a fairy creature, kind of reflecting that otherworldly nature of the Tasmanian ecosystem as it was discovered at the time. Uh, and it is, um, uh, it's the kind of creature that's meant to start an adventure, to, to pull you into a place you didn't necessarily want to be and aren't necessarily very comfortable with. Um, we like to think that our ghost tiger can be uh, associated more with beginnings than endings. Uh, we're pushing close to time, so I'll push on because there, I do want to show you the gastric brooding frog. Um, this is Rio Batrachis silus. Uh, and um, so this image comes from Michael Tyler at the University of Ad Adelaide. He was one of the few researchers to discover uh, the gastric brooding frog because it's one of those creatures that kind of minds its own business. Um, one source that I found suggested that this creature moved maybe uh, 175 feet in the course of a year. It just liked to be where it was uh, and do what it did. And one of the things that it did very well uh, was a unique strategy of raising its young. The, the mother frog would uh, 
lay her eggs and then ingest them and then brood them in her stomach. For some, for reasons we still don't understand, she was able to suppress the production of her own stomach acid, allowing her tadpoles to develop into fully formed froglets, which she then regurgitated. And as far as we know, no other vertebrate is known to exhibit this behavior. Uh, and what drove the gastric brooding frog extinct is kind of the, I guess, maybe the boogeyman of, of frogs all over the world right now. It's a fungal disease called Batrococytrium dendrobotitis, or BD. Um, or if you want to, or it, it causes a disease called chytridiomycosis. Basically, it interrupts the ability of the frog to absorb electrolytes through its skin, essentially giving them a heart attack. And uh, what you, you told me the number on this, Tierra, it was, uh, I believe, a 90% fatality rate across species. Yeah, chytrid fungus has really contributed to the loss of amphibians around the globe and is still an ongoing threat. There's been a lot of breakthroughs in its treatment, and there's some that survived and are resistant to it. But it, as it spread, and some people think that it was spread because of wildlife trade, which is an issue we're still fighting. Um, there's a fungus that affects salamanders, so we're trying to stop salamanders from being in wildlife trade as long as and as well as other creatures around the world, because when you're trading in live animals, you're just spreading diseases, which have the potential to jump to humans and cause pandemics. So <laughs> there's definitely a, a lesson mm -hmm, to be learned yeah. here. And bats too, the white nose syndrome has wiped out like 90% of bats. And so we don't have it up yet, but soon we'll have an action alert up for you to help protect the little brown bat, which has been decimated by by white nose syndrome. Okay, so you probably didn't have to do much to turn this frog into a magical character because it's already kind yeah, of a magical no, this character. Is, <laughs> this is as close as we get to actual magic, I think. Yeah. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's so lovely about doing this project is that there are kind of these little breadcrumbs of, uh, of real world magic sprinkled in throughout the game. It was very easy. There's a there's an item that most Dungeons and Dragons play, players are familiar with called the bag of holding. Um, so it's just a bag that is bigger on the inside, and basically it was created so that we didn't have to keep track on a on a piece of paper with how much weight is your character carrying and how big is your backpack. Like we don't care, put it in the bag. Let's play the game. Um, so so the bag of holding was very uh, is very kind of signature to D and D. Uh, so it wasn't much of a leap at all uh, to create a frog of holding. This is a frog that has an extra dimensional, a naturally occurring extra dimensional space in its own stomach. Um, and so that that suggests to me that naturally uh, there's another frog inside. Uh, we <laughs> um, uh, my, our artist on this project is also named Lucas. And in this image, he blew me away again because he perfectly balanced this whole, like, if you scale up frogs, they are terrifying. They're an incredibly effective predator. <laughs> and <laughs> if they were any bigger than they are, I would be very upset. Um, so we've got a, a great balance here between absolutely terrifying and hilarious. Uh, and I'll give you a sense of scale. Most uh, most things in the game become dangerous because they become giant. It's very easy to like scale things up and now it's a monster. So this is how big I would be in the game. Uh, and this is how big the frog would be, <laughs> sort of roughly-ish maybe. Uh, so you frequently you're swallowed by things larger than you in the game. That's a challenge that your character has to face. Uh, but in this case, uh, now you're inside the frog and there is another smaller frog and it is it is angry and it has plans to which it would like the larger frog to proceed. Um, so for me, the gastric rooting frog is a source of infinite joy. It's now an inside joke, uh, the frog of holding and D&D &D players latch onto this very quickly. They know exactly what this thing is. Uh, so that was that was really fun to kind of, uh, yeah, exactly like Russian nesting dolls. Uh, it was really, so you can, if you, if you are small enough, you can be swallowed by the large one and then swallowed by the small one. Good luck. That's the problem that you have to solve now. Uh, <laughs> so what Book of Extinction does for us is um, is gives us a way to, to have another thing to talk about with this creature, um, to, to introduce people to the BD 
uh, crisis and how it's going and why it's important, but also to say, look, let's have a great time. Uh, and you know, I don't want to leave people in despair or 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 anger. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe you could charm this and make this your familiar. Um, it would per periodically barf up stuff that you didn't put in the frog. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so let's um we've got about 13 minutes left if you want to put questions over not in the chat but over in the q a we can get to your questions and then i've seen several questions about how to get the book is it available digitally and are there upcoming events like how can people interact with this yeah best place to go right now is at deadmonstermanual.com or you can go over to kickstarter and search book of extinction you'll find this image that's how you'll know you're in the right place um, we've rendered the thylacine in blue this time. Uh, and uh, the the uh, campaign will be going on through April 20th. Um, we're about two, two or three days into a 30-day to a campaign. There are digital and hard copy versions uh, for people so that and and uh, uh, um, virtual tabletop options. So however you play the game, however you enjoy stories, um, we can get it to you in that way. Um, I, I did want to say that like one of the things that I did when I was a kid was finding that monster manual and paging through it. And um, one of the people that I that I showed this project to was like, I have a six-year-old who goes through my Dungeons and Dragons shelf all the time and just like looks at the pictures. He said, I think I'm going to leave this one out for him to find. Um, if nothing else, even if you don't play Dungeons and Dragons, this is uh, this is an art book and a conversation piece, and we have worked very hard to make it a piece of historical and literary and educational value. Um, so there's something for everyone here, and it is available in uh, in every way that you enjoy the game. Is there a list of the species at dead, the Dead Monster Manual link, all the species in the book? Uh, there is not yet. We are working on it. Uh, <laughs> um, I can tell you that you can uh, uh, you can go to the Kickstarter page and download a sample of the monsters in the book. Like you can see a handful of the ones that we have done, including I think all of the ones that I've shown you, plus the Stevens Island Wren, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, we have some uh, we have some stretch goals that are going on right now. We've already met our funding goal, but the more we add to this book, the better it gets. Um, so there's a handful of late additions to the book, and we are planning to make an update to the Kickstarter page that tells everybody what's inside. Um, some of the ones that come up quite often are the, the Carolina parakeet. That's a hard yes. The uh, giant moa of New Zealand. That's a hard yes as well. Um, Host's eagle, also from New Zealand, I think, or, or Madagascar. Uh, I get them mixed up because they have very similar uh, storage, uh, very similar stories. On the cover is the, uh, starting from the thylacine and working our way anti-clockwise, the, there's the thylacine, the great auk, um, Euclatoceros, a Pleistocene megafauna from uh, from the Valdarno Valley in Italy, um, the oryx, the sort of primeval progenitor cattle of, uh, of Northern Europe, and of course, uh, the dodo bird, Raphis cuculatus. There was no way we were going to miss the dodo. Of course there was going to be a dodo. Someone asked specifically if there's a primate, and I can't remember. Uh, you know, I don't know that there is a primate. I'll have to check. I know we considered a lemur or two, uh, and we got very we got very full on mammals very quickly. Um, I will check though. I I, I would love. <laughs> Aurex, thank you. <laughs> At one point, I was uh, I was had to, I did have to be reminded that Aurex is both singular and plural as well, um, much like species. Someone asked if we included citations. Yes, yes, we did. Hundreds of them. That's one of the reasons <laughs> that this book has taken two years to write, because um, it was one thing I I started adding those when I uh, realized that. Um, the year a creature went extinct was a matter of heated debate in many cases, because, uh, of course, it's proving the absence of something, and absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And when I realized that that most basic fact about extinction is up for, uh, is up in the air and up for, uh, well, up for scientific debate and uh, peer review, then I knew I had to give people the ability to trace my work. Um, to know which sources I was taking as authoritative and, and which ones I had passed on. So there are hundreds of footnotes in the book. 
um, most of which are publicly available. And I am hugely indebted to uh, my local library and the interlibrary loan system. <laughs> uh, support your local librarians, friends. There's a question about when a species is declared extinct versus endangered and if a few specimens are found. And that's, that is the question. There's debate about when to call a species extinct. There's critically endangered, which actually means extinct in the wild. There's time periods that have to go by. And even the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wants to remove 23 species from the endangered species list because they are extinct. And the ivory billed woodpecker has generated a lot of controversy and public hearings because there are people who believe strongly that it still exists. And there are people who are like, if it does, then it would have been found. And so it's a very tricky thing to declare something extinct because you don't want to end any conservation efforts or funding for it by calling it too soon. And so, yeah, it's complicated is <laughs> the answer to that question. Um, another question that is in the Q&A is why is conservation important and how do we get the message out there? This project is one of the ways I, I talk about conservation and ecosystem services and extinction and the importance of protecting biodiversity and a livable climate and doing it at the same time every day to students. But how do we get the message out to more people? And that's why I was so passionate about this project is because it's a whole new audience to talk to about extinction. And it's an audience of smart, creative people who are going to like share it with other people. Yeah, and these are the these people are already on board, like, even if they don't know it. Uh, it's the concept of extinction is so deeply embedded in uh, so much of uh, what makes fantasy and Dungeons and Dragons what it is. I knew it was going to be a slam dunk. And I was proven right uh, when I took it to a couple of conventions. The people who lock in on this lock in hard. And I'm really excited for to to give them the tools they need to to be able to talk about this well. There's a question about are there calls to action or resources to help wildlife inside the book of this project? Uh, we're relying. This is one of the reasons I'm so excited about the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, there. This book has limits. Um, <laughs> there's only so much it can do, especially when it becomes a hardcover and it's sort of disconnected from live data sets and uh, and and uh, web links and and URLs and so on. Um, so part of what we hope this book can do is uh, stop the sliding scale and give people the tools to talk about extinction. We think that's success in its own right. Um, and we're taking every opportunity uh, through. Um, through the citations and the footnotes in the books and the introductions and the uh, kind of um, footnotes and extra things that we have to, to familiarize people with what's going on to point them toward people who are better at this, like the Center for Biological Diversity. Yeah, we did a, a little project, a test launch a couple months ago, and the proceeds from those characters were graciously donated to the center. Lucas, there's a specific question here about promotional tie-ins that are lined up, YouTubers, podcasters, et cetera, to play. There's a question about the last owlbear one-shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's only, we're working on a, a charity stream for the last owlbear one-shot. Details on that are, are in the air. It turns out there's a whole lot more to running a Kickstarter than even I knew. Um, so we're hoping to have that sometime in the last week of April, but we'll see how it goes. I can tell you that some of the extinct megafauna in the book and maybe some of the uh, sub-fossil creatures as well are going to be a part of Ox Ventures. Um, their latest, uh, that's that's kind of the actual play arm of Outside Xbox and the games journalists over there. Um, so this Friday, uh, tomorrow actually, they're releasing an episode that uh, we sponsored and then they're doing a live show at PAX East um, where they're going to be using some of the monsters from the game, and we're excited to partner with them on that. Um, feel free to get in touch if you know more people who would like to be a part of it uh, and work with the last owl bear. Uh, in case you don't know what an owl bear is, um, by reading the world owl bear, <laughs> you know what an owl bear is. It is as ridiculous and hilarious and fun as it sounds. Um, D and D players love owl bears, so when we suggested an adventure about the very last one there ever was, uh, we knew that we would have them by the heartstrings. There's lots of suggestions for characters to include <laughs> and other ideas here in the Q&A. Maybe some of the additional things that are getting funded through the Kickstarter could incorporate those. And 
you guys can, you all can feel free to reach out to me and Lucas with your ideas. Um, my email is tcurry at biologicaldiversity.org. We're both on Twitter and promoting each other in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Twitter is a great place to get a hold of me. Yeah. Uh, my handle is at Spark Otter, uh, exactly like it sounds. So we have just a couple minutes left. Lucas, you want to wrap up with any concluding thoughts and ways to get involved and anything you want to say? Uh, yeah, thanks again so much for the opportunity to share these stories. Um, I've, uh, I'm gradually becoming comfortable with the idea of being an expert on extinction or the extinction guy. Um, I'm, I'm excited that this will be the first of many times I get to tell these stories in front of, in front of an audience and bring more attention to this. If you want to get involved with Book of Extinction, the best way to do it now is to find us on Kickstarter. You can go to deadmonstermanual.com if you want to uh, get redirected there or search on Kickstarter for Book of Extinction. Um, we have read, we have met our funding goal, uh, more quickly than I thought we would. So the book is definitely happening, but uh, there are still stretch goals to be unlocked. The more we are able to make, the better the book is able to be. Uh, and more importantly, the bigger this book gets, the more of a bright neon sign it lights for people to understand that we care about this and we care about addressing it in every way that we possibly can. Um, and people both in and out of the D&D space will begin to take it seriously. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, jump over to Kickstarter. Um, there's a lot of ways to get the game, a lot of extras that you uh, can can peruse through. Um, feel free to back at whatever level you uh, you are. Uh, if we've earned it, you can back at whatever level you feel comfortable with. Um, even if you don't, I would love for you to spread the word about this. Um, we're in the midst of a massive, uh, massive fundraising effort, so there's always going to be new tweets and new material, new episodes of the podcast out for you to engage with and share around. Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, a lot of other people who have similar ideas. I'm looking to network and see uh, how many other. Um, people whose hands we can get this in and, and give people the tools to tell these stories in this way. Um, Definitely so check out the podcast because it's a deep dive on these creatures. Like we talked about the Florida fairy shrimp for almost an hour. Kiron, <laughs> what, what species did Kiron do? I can't. Oh, um, Kiron and I auk? talked about a couple of things. The ivory okay. goat woodpecker, the great auk. Uh, and uh, I think that was the big one. I think those were the big ones. His voice is in a, a smattering of the extinction episodes as well. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us tonight, because fighting extinction doesn't have to be all depression and gloom and doom. It can be creative and exciting. And what inspires me is the the support of all of you and also just all of the amazing things that people are doing to raise awareness, to make individual lifestyle changes and to fight for policy. So this is the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. And next month, we're going to have a webinar about ESA at 50 with my colleague Stephanie Caros is going to host that. So look, look to your email to register for that one. And Lucas, thank you so much. And thank you, Fabi and our digital team and everyone for joining. This was fun. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's been my absolute pleasure. I look forward to seeing you. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone.